Good evening. Uh, thank you all uh, for coming uh, this evening for actually our last event uh, of this semester in the Armenian Studies Program uh, uh, Lecture Series. Uh, we're very happy to have uh, our very own uh, Professor Barlow Dermagadushian's reflections on his recent trip to historic Armenia that he took this past summer uh, in the month of June. Uh, before I, uh, I introduce Barlow, um, I would like to make one announcement that uh, this Saturday um, is, the, is International Culture Night, Cultural Night, and there will be an event at the Satellite Student Union in which the uh, Armenian Students Organization will be performing. Now, the entire night goes from 7 to 9, uh, but I've been told that the Armenian students will be performing around 7.30, so try and get there um, early, and we encourage you all uh, uh, to attend. Um, otherwise, uh, we're very happy uh, to have uh, Barlow speak to us uh, this evening uh, on this wonderful topic in that a lot has changed in uh, Eastern Anatolia, Western Armenia, uh, since maybe some of you went, definitely since I went, the last time I was there was 1997. Um, and so there have been uh, hopefully some positive changes, I'm sure also um, some sadder changes, but we're, we're very interested in seeing uh, these pictures that Barlow was able to take this summer. So without further ado, I invite Barlow to come up and, and give us Thank you, uh, Professor Laporta. Uh, there are some seats here. If any of you in the back would like to uh, find a seat, and I think there's still a little bit of room left. Uh, what a wonderful pleasure it is to be able to uh, address you tonight on a topic which I think for many of us here uh, is quite important. And the topic is uh, Armenia, memories and images. And tonight's presentation is, for me, uh, sort of a dual approach to the question of Armenia. Uh, I use the term memories because uh, for most of us, and I'm talking about the Armenians here, that come from Armenia originally, historic Armenia, uh, my generation, it would be my grandparents that immigrated, and uh, for us, we heard the stories about where they lived and about the places that they lived and what they did, and of course we heard about the genocide, but they were, for us, memories because well, we never got to see those places. Uh, now, in the past few years, in the past few decades, there's been an opportunity for more and more people to travel to historic Armenia and to see some of those places which have meaning for, for us even today. The images, of course, are the images, uh, and I have a dual meaning for images here. They are the images that we're going to see, but often we're going to see images with no people, which means that simply that these are the remnants of what once was a place called Armenia. And as we travel through the areas uh, of historic Armenia, we'll see some of the history and some of the unexpected people and unexpected events that took place. Tonight I'll be showing you uh, mostly slides, but at the end I have a, a very short video that I put together just of some interesting things that were kind of different. Some places that we see in the slides, but we see it in, in video because I think it's important to see the video. And then some things which I didn't include in the, uh, in the, in the pictures. I took over six, six hours of a video, so you can imagine uh, going through that uh, is taking me some time, and there's a lot of things to still sort of unravel. In other words, when you go on a trip like this, it's as if everything is compressed. Time is compressed, uh, the images are compressed, everything that you're taking in is compressed, and it takes you often years. For me, it's going to take at least a couple of years to really be able to reflect on it and someday I would like to write about my experiences. And certainly I've been inspired to go back again and look at more, because for me it was a trip of a lifetime. Uh, one that actually had been in, in the planning since the early 1980s. Dr. R. Avakin had taken a, a tour uh, of Armenians from California back in 1982. And I was supposed to go on that trip, and some of you know some of the people that went on that trip. Mark Malkasian, Rafi Hovanusian, Armin Hovanusian, and several others all went on that trip. And it was a time when there was uh, some political violence taking place, Armenian political violence, and it affected that trip. Yeah. However, for me, uh, it took me many years to sort of come to the point where I came to the conclusion that I needed to go and visit these places. Uh, later on, you'll all have an opportunity, because as I look around, I know that many of you here in the audience have actually gone on this same trip. And the same trip, I mean to go back to Armenia to make those connections. 
I would ask that everyone just kind of keep the questions until the end, and then we'll have an opportunity to discuss and talk about perhaps how your memories compare with my memories. This is also for me a very uh, personal uh, journey that I took, as it is for many people, because my family, as I mentioned to you, is from the areas that I'm going to be visiting. In particular, my father's family is from a place called Vaughan, V-A-N, and we're going to see quite a bit of Vaughan in uh, this uh, presentation. And along the way, it gave me uh, reason to think about the trip that they took, their journey from Armenia to America, and what they had to endure and what they saw. And I think uh, I'll give you a flavor of that, because as you go to those places, they come alive. So if you've heard about these places in stories, these are the memories. But when you see the images and you go and visit the places, they become alive. I'm not going to give you a much more sort of uh, preface to this, but we'll start uh, immediately with the slides. I took the trip uh, from January 23rd to January 20, uh, January, uh, June 23rd to June 29th uh, of this summer. That was the tri trip to what I call historic Armenia, that is the eastern part of what is today Turkey. But I also did go uh, for a week to Istanbul, to Constantinople. <coughs> It was my first trip also to that area of the world. And for me, again, it was uh, a place that I always wanted to see because of its uh, importance as the center and a capital of the Byzantine Empire, and later as the capital of the Ottoman Empire, and then a home to many Armenians, Greeks, and other groups throughout the centuries. So it was a place that I wanted to see uh, through, through my own eyes. So I'm going to lower the lights, and then we'll start uh, the journey. I can go all the way out with the lights. Do you prefer all the way out with the lights? Okay, so we should be able to go out. We don't want to see each other. Um, so Jim, you're back there. Can you press that bottom little button that you see there? That should put all the lights out. There you go. Okay, great. All right, so I'm going to uh, just give you my narrative and my images of historic Armenia. But I first started in Istanbul or Constantinople. So. Constantinople is the historical name for the city. In Armenian, uh, most people simply call it Bolis, which means the city. Uh, and this is my views of Bolis. Bolis is a fantastic uh, city as far as its geographic location. It straddles uh, two continents, Asia and Europe. And this is a view from my uh, room where I was staying for a week. And I'm overlooking the Sea of Marmara, which is directly uh, in the background. I do have a green pointer. so. This is my pointer over here. And then uh, one of the famous mosques of uh, Istanbul. And then some grape leaves. So, so how fitting it is to sort of see all of these uh, symbols in Istanbul. 4.30 in the morning, first morning, the call to prayer. So uh, in, in an Islamic country, you're going to hear the call to prayer. Uh, one of the most fantastic uh, places to visit is the Hagia Sophia, which is the church which was built by the Emperor Justinian in the 6th century. Here it is. Uh, there is an Armenian connection. Uh, the church was damaged in an earthquake, and most people say that it was the Armenian uh, architect Terdat who was called from Armenia. He was the architect for the Cathedral of Ani. He was called to Constantinople to repair the dome because no one else was able to do so. Here's a little closer view of it. Of course, the dome is one of the largest freestanding domes on any Christian church in the world, perhaps the largest, uh, with four minarets, when Istanbul was, uh, Constantinople was uh, captured, conquered by the Ottoman Turks, it was for a brief moment turned into a uh, mosque. That's when the minarets were built. And then today it's a museum, so you can go and visit it. And this is the inside of the uh, church. Fantastic <coughs> detail and a lot of things to see. I can't really explain all of them, but uh, it's, a, it's a sort of a wealth of impressions for uh, all of your senses both uh, seeing things and hearing things. And then the uh, mosaics of the emperor and the empress here surrounding Jesus and Mary. Uh, the church was covered with beautiful mosaics. Uh, this is an area which was called the Hippodrome, uh, which was really one of the centers of the uh, Constantinople. It was the place where the horse races took place. It was very important in Byzantine history. Uh, I, I show it for a couple of reasons. One is the Egyptian obelisk, which was brought from <coughs> Egypt by the Emperor uh, Const, uh, Theodosius in the fourth century. But also the place I stayed was only about five minutes away. So every morning I would walk through this area 
It's right next to the Hagia Sophia, and it's one of the most beautiful areas. Of course, the water, the Bosporus, uh, one of the beautiful areas in uh, Istanbul, Constantinople, another mosque. But again, for me, I always wanted to see these Armenian places. And so the center for the Armenian community today in uh, Constantinople is the Armenian Patriarchate of Constantinople, the headquarters of the Armenian Church. At one time, there were more than 2,800 Armenian churches and monasteries in the, um, in the world, most of them which were in historic Armenia, that is, were in the area which became part of Turkey. The center, the head of that, was at the Patriarchate of Constantinople, in the Kumkapu district of uh, Constantinople. This is the official, official reception room where the Patriarch would sit to greet his guests. And you can see that it's been beautifully uh, renovated. Now this is uh, Archbishop Ateshian. Archbishop Ateshian is the uh, vicar of the Patriarchate. The Patriarch, unfortunately, Archbishop Mutafian, uh, is very seriously ill and has been incapacitated for the past two or three years. He is no longer able to uh, lead the church. So in his place, Archbishop Ateshian is the leader now of the uh, church in Constantinople. And I had a chance to uh, visit with him and to discuss uh, something of the Armenian community in Constantinople and in uh, Turkey, what's happening. And it's, a, it's an interesting story. Uh, there's a lot of Armenians actually moving from Armenia, the country of Armenia, to Turkey, to Constantinople, looking for work. So he has those concerns. There are more than 33 active churches in, Armenian churches in Constantinople. And so that is all his responsibility. Even though the population is 50 or 60,000 and it's dwindling. So there's that problem as well that he has to face. Here's Archbishop Mutafian in the, uh, in the back over here. And then of course, Archbishop Ateshia. This is the official patriarchal residence. Uh, that is where the patriarch uh, lived. Today he's in a hospital, as I said. The patriarch himself is in the hospital in serious condition, but this is where he lived in Constantinople. Now, this is one of the unexpected uh, places that I had visited. Uh, the two people that you see here are actually professors uh, who were my uh, friends in Constantinople. They were the people that kind of were my guides because they've visited here frequently. And recently they have published a beautiful book, which you haven't, if you haven't seen, you really need to get a hold of. It's called The Art, Art Treasures of Constantinople. And what they did was to go to the Armenian churches and go into the archives and bring out all of the beautiful treasures, especially textile works, meaning clothing, vestments, and all of those kinds of things. Uh, Professor Marchese on the right, who actually will be here in January to give a talk on his uh, book, and then Marlene <coughs> Brew over here. Well, we're in front of a, a sort of a wall, and it's actually the entrance to the Surp Harutun Church. Harutun is resurrection, holy resurrection church. Look how beautiful it is. This is the courtyard inside of those walls. The walls are there from the outside. You wouldn't even know you're, in a, you're near a church. This is the uh, fisherman's church. Uh, this is all, no more than about uh, two or three blocks away from the coastline. And the Armenian fishermen, who in the 19th century were living in, in Constantinople, built this church. It's a very small church. And actually, I was fortunate to go on a, a Sunday, the first Sunday that I was in uh, Constantinople, the only Sunday. Uh, but I visited the church. You can see it's a very small congregation. There were no more than eight or 10 people at any one time. Uh, a very small choir, and then uh, the priest. But you can see the beautiful design of the church. It's a 19th century uh, church. And you can see the, the, what they call the French neoclassical design, uh, which was used frequently in Armenian churches. Now, fortunately, afterwards, yeah, it was Father's Day. So it was June 17th. And so they were having, uh, afterwards, the parishioners and the parish priest were having something to eat to break bread on, on Father's Day. And they invited us to stay and, and join them. And I did. Uh, this man here is Mr. Yan Yan. And his family is uh, his Grandfather and great-grandfather were involved in the building of the church, and he is still a very important member of the church. Uh, this man here actually lived in Chicago for many years. Uh, he knows the Farsakian family. Some of you know the Farsakians from Visalia. And now he has moved back in retirement to live back in Constantinople. And it was a very simple but uh, very nice meal. They had uh, 
cheese and tomatoes and then some tea. And uh, this was the priest over here. My point here was that we spent a couple of hours just discussing the, the challenges that the Armenian community has in maintaining their churches in Constantinople. So the problem is twofold. Dwindling population, uh, younger people don't stay in the city, they emigrate, and then the financial burden of keeping the church uh, open and, of course, in good shape. Uh, the other part that I uh, was found very interesting in Constantinople, and I talked about memories and images. The memories are that Constantinople, at the turn of the 20th century, was a city that had a majority population which was non-Turkish. There were more Armenians and Greeks and non-Turks living in, in Istanbul than there were Turks. And the Armenian presence is just everywhere, especially in an area like Kum Kapo. So this is near the Armenian Patriarchate. You'll say, well, this is a building in ruins. It is. But you see the balcony? That's an Armenian balcony. That is an Armenian building. We know that that was built by Armenians because the architecture is that. And the people that I was with knew also that at one time it was owned by Armenians. So it's interesting because the city is changing so rapidly. Uh, this is the St. Gregory the Illuminator Church in, um, in Beolu, uh, excuse me, not in Beolu, but in, the, in one of the areas of Istanbul. But next to it, you see this building? This is perhaps the most famous high school in all of uh, Constantinople called, in Armenian, Getronagan Central High School, which this year is celebrating its 125th anniversary. And uh, the graduates of this high school were the teachers and the leaders of the Armenian community in all of the Ottoman Empire for 125 years. Uh, I was able to visit with the uh, principal. Uh, on the fourth floor, they had an art show that they were doing. They have a science area. They're really keeping it going. And they're right next to this church, which you can see is right next to the road because uh, the Turkish government has taken part of the church property to have the road. But at least the church is still in fairly good uh, condition. And I just threw this in here because I thought you wanted to see some Armenian. Uh, this is Kod Agok's uh, fish restaurant. Kod in, in Turkish means blind. Uh, and it's actually a fish restaurant. And actually, we had lunch there. So it's called Kod Agok. Just thought that you'd find that interesting. The Kapala Charsha, the covered market, is one of the oldest and most interesting parts in all of uh, Constantinople. But again, the Armenian presence is what uh, made it interesting for me. Uh, this man here is. His name is Murat Bilev. He's Armenian. He runs a small antique shop in the older part of the market. Turns out his parents are from the same place my mother's parents are from, a city called Toka. So it turns out that we were uh, from the same place, Haidenagis. And so uh, we chatted and met and talked uh, for a long time. And he actually taught me a few things about Toka, which I had never uh, known before. Uh, I had found information that my great-grandfather was involved in a business uh, which they called Shut Up. Shut Up is kind of wine, but they made a very special sweet wine in Tokat, and he knew about it because his parents actually lived there, and he goes and visits Tokat. So it was a connection that I made in Constantinople, which was directly uh, a memory for me. Uh, this is sad here. Uh, this is Constantinople. Behind this gentleman, Professor Marchese is the offices of the Agos newspaper. Agos newspaper is a newspaper founded by uh, Hrant Dink. And uh, some of you know the story of Hrant Dink. He was a uh, Armenian newspaper editor who in uh, 2007 was shot and killed in front of his office. And the spot you see here was where he was killed. And he was killed by a young Turkish nationalist uh, for no more reason than being an Armenian who spoke he spoke really about reconciliation and about ways that Turks and Armenians could at least open a conversation about the genocide. But for that reason, uh, he was killed. And this is the spot he was killed. And this is the sidewalk memorial. It says in Armenian, Herat Dink was killed here on January 19, 2007 at 3 o'clock, 3.05 uh, p.m. This is a, a murder which uh, shocked uh, the world. Actually, if you remember, uh, we were going to have Professor Taner Akcham speak in Fresno that same weekend. And the assassination happened that same weekend he was coming here. And so he went back to Turkey to go to the funeral. And this was an event which uh, really affected even Turkish people, who came out in large numbers in protest of the murder 
and of the people that were responsible for uh, the murder. Now, this man on the right is today the editor, has taken over for Harad Dink. His name is Robert Koptash. Koptash is his sort of Turkified name. Uh, but he is married to Harad Dink's daughter. We're standing in the library, uh, actually in the office, and all of these are legal papers uh, on the Dink trial because they're still trying to get to the bottom of who exactly was responsible for it. Yes, they did arrest uh, some young people and they were uh, convicted of the crime, but there was pretty much evidence that it was a larger conspiracy because he had been threatened before uh, with his life. Uh, here's Hrana Dink in the background, and again, Robert Koptash, a very brave young uh, newspaper editor whose newspaper is in Turkish and in Armenian. It's a very uh, progressive newspaper in the sense that he is talking about issues which are important today. If you read Turkish or Armenian, you can go online and read Agos. It's a very important newspaper to understand what is happening in the Armenian community. We had a chance to have a long conversation. It turned out that uh, the same weekend I was in uh, Turkey, Rafi Hovanisyan was also in Turkey. Uh, he had come from Armenia and was visiting uh, newspaper editors and talking in Turkey. And I met him in the airport when I was going to Armenia. So um, he was also there. Now, uh, another important Armenian footprint, I call it, something that says that, yes, Armenians did live in Constantinople, is the Shishli Armenian Cemetery. This is the largest and most important cemetery in uh, Constantinople, and I'm standing in front of the tomb of the very famous poet Daniel Varujan, who was killed in the Armenian Genocide of 1915. He had been arrested on April 24th. Uh, later, he was brought back here to Shishli. And these are the tombs of the patriarchs. So uh, the patriarchs who die are buried in Shishli, and uh, these are the immediate previous patriarchs, uh, Archbishop Kazanjan, Archbishop Shunor Kalustian, some of you remember these names because Archbishop Kalustian used to be in California, uh, and they are the former patriarchs. But Shishli is a large, exclusively Armenian cemetery. It's in a very exclusive area today of Turkey. It's not far from the Agos newspaper. In fact, right nearby there's a Trump Tower, and it's a very, uh, a very economically advanced area of Constantinople. It's a very rich area, but it's behind walls. You'd never know you were near a cemetery. Okay, now this was all preliminary, but let's now enter into Armenia. Uh, I uh, went to Yerevan, and my trip started in Yerevan. And what we're going to do is, like, each day I'll show a map, kind of the, the route that we went, and then some of the important places that we saw. So here's the map. Yerevan is down here. The green is, the, is sort of the rough area that we traveled. And the first day was to travel from Yerevan to Kars. Now look at the green. Travel all the way up and all the way down. Here's Turkey in white, and this is Armenia in uh, sort of the purple. Here's the border. Well, Turkey is blockading Armenia. There are no open border crossings between Armenia and Turkey. So you cannot travel directly by car or by bus from Armenia to Turkey. So what do you have to do? You have to go through Georgia. And this border is the Georgian border. And you have to go all this extra distance. So here's Gumri, which is Armenia. And you have to go all this extra distance to get to cars where you could take the blue if it were open. You know how far that is? 41 miles. So you know, instead of going 41 miles and maybe you know, an hour drive from Gumri to cars, you have to spend pretty much the rest of the day. And it takes you about six hours to get all this way uh, down over here. The border is here at a place called Kosok. Um, and then you get to cars over here. The next few slides will be of uh, the Armenian area called Jabal, which is in the southern part of uh, Georgia. And in the city called Akhal Kalaf, there's an, actually a, a, a statue to Mesrop Mashtos, the founder of the Armenian alphabet. Why do I show this? Because Akhal Kalaf is basically an Armenian town. 90% of the population is Armenian. The area of Jabal is 80 to 90% Armenian. Uh, it is an Armenian presence. You see Armenian signs on the wall. I was even told that in this city of Akhal Kalaf that the Armenian tram, the currency, can be used equally with the Georgian currency because the Armenians are so much in contact with the people in Armenia. There's a whole story to be told on Jabba. Uh, this is another town called Akhal Sikh. This is a, another older uh, Armenian area. 
but this is the Georgian castle, which has now been refurbished. It's just a striking place that I wanted to show. Uh, this is still in Georgia, but you have to travel through this to get to, uh, to Turkey. Our first stop is cars. You're going to see a lot of these uh, signs. And my friend and I were looking through the pictures. He goes, did you take, stop and take a picture at every sign? I go, yes, I did, because I knew that someday I'd be speaking about it, and I'd want to show you what we're talking about. Nufus in Turkish is population. Rakim is elevation in meters. So we're at cars, 77,000. Rakim is 1768, uh, which is roughly three times. It's over six close to 6,000 feet elevation. Kars is a very high uh, city. Uh, a little bit of the history of Kars, very briefly you can read it, I don't need to read all of it, but uh, the important part is Kars was the capital of an Armenian kingdom. Later it was conquered by the Turks and by other people, later it was, became a part of the Russian Empire, and then in 1918 it was part of the independent Republic of Armenia. Kars is an important strategic town because it controls access to the entire Caucasus. In the old days, when you talked about horses and cannons and everything else. This is the hotel we stayed in. A three-star hotel, very nice, hot water, electricity, everything is fine with this hotel. But lo and behold, the, this is the first night we're just getting there. Um, Turkish time is one hour before Armenian time, so you have to turn your clocks back. It just is an interesting thing. What did we find right outside? Uh -huh. A statue to the Azerbaijani president, Haider Aliyev, the former communist leader of uh, Azerbaijan, a very much anti-Armenian figure who claimed that we will take Karabakh back from the Armenians. And here I was, right outside the hotel, is a statue to Haider Aliyev. Why is that? Because Turkey and Azerbaijan are very close, meaning close culturally and close politically. And the Azerbaijani government is paying for these statues to go up in many cities throughout the world, including in Mexico City. There's the story that we know about. And then uh, the, the city of Kars itself is sort of a dusty frontier town, I call it. Uh, I was walking down the street. We were going to exchange money over here. And we see people playing backgammon or tablo. They're just sitting here playing. Uh, there were no cars here because they were repaving the road. You can kind of see somebody repaving here. Lots of bicycles. 99% of the population is Kurdish, not Armenian, uh, not Turkish, Kurdish. So this is an area, uh, most of the area I travel is going to be uh, Kurdish. There were a couple of important, again, Armenian footprints, places that, uh, as a person who has studied Armenian literature and Armenian history, for me, when, when I found these places, they were truly discoveries. This is believed to be the remnants of the home of the most famous resident of Kars, the Armenian poet Yerishe Charens. Uh, Yerishe Charens was born in Kars. Uh, he was killed in Armenia by the communists in 1937. But this is believed to be uh, all that's left of his home. When the Armenians identified this, some Armenians in Armenia identified it, they wanted to buy this to sort of renovate it, to make it into a museum, a house museum. The owners, finding out that Armenians wanted it, raised the price. It's like $200,000 or something to buy this now. Uh, of course, it's just a remnant, but uh, the Turkish people who owned it, understanding that Armenians wanted to use it, uh, raised the price. And then the famous uh, citadel of Kars, uh, the famous fortress, which overlooks the entire area. Uh, this was a place that had changed hands several times over the, over the past 100 years or so. But for me, again, uh, as a place of pilgrimage and as a place of spiritual feeling, and to me, when I talk about this trip, it's feeling, too, it's emotion. It's not just history, something you read on the, on the page. Uh, but this is the very well-known Surbara Kelot's church, the Holy Apostles' Church of Kars, which was constructed in the middle of the 10th century by the King Abbas of the Bagratid Armenian Kingdom. There was an Armenian capital in Kars, and this was the church built by the Armenian king. And today it's a museum, or they call it a mosque. They don't really have services there. There's a sign here, which makes no mention of anything Armenian. As you well know, in, in these sites, there's no mention of anything Armenian. So it says church, or it says actually uh, Jami, which means uh, mosque. But it's a beautiful dark stone, which is the Kars stone. Uh, many of the buildings in Kars are built out of these darker, it's called a basalt or a tufa stone. 
and it's a very important uh, place in cars. Here's the view from the citadel down into the city, and here's the cars uh, church here. You can see how it dominates the whole area. The Turkish uh, authorities built a mosque right next to it. Uh, you know, it's a way of sort of taking away attention uh, literally from this uh, church, which is no longer functioning as a church. I wanted to show you our group. Uh, we were six people, a driver and a guide. Our guide is over here, our driver here. Six people in the group, five from Armenia, uh, one from Australia. <clears throat> when I say five from Armenia, one is actually living in Russia now because they've left Armenia for work. And then one, this lady is living in Belgium because she is looking for work. So, you know, we were a very disparate group. Uh, this is our place uh, in the hotel where we were having breakfast. And I can tell you that for me, the food was uh, very authentic Armenian food, I call it, only in the sense that, you know, it's food that I was familiar with. So the food is something we'll see a little bit later as well. Okay, that was day one. Now day two starts in Kars, so we're up here. And we're gonna travel all the way down to Van, which is the area of my uh, paternal grandparents. But we're gonna take a very important stop on the way, which is to Ani. Nine o'clock in the morning, uh, we're gonna get to Ani. It's about an hour drive from Kars. We're gonna go to the capital of Armenia in the 10th and 11th century, part of, again, the Bagratid Kingdom. And one of the distinctive features of uh, the city of Ani are its medieval uh, walls which were never breached in an actual war because uh, they are so formidable. They are large, double walls. You can see here a better idea of the scale. Look at the human and then look at the scale of the walls. Uh, these are basically as they have been. They haven't been renovated at all. Ani is an area of earthquakes, so there's a lot of damage in the city from earthquakes. I want to show you here uh, these roads. These are the pathways that take you to different parts today of the city. And I said city, and you probably were saying, well, where's all the buildings? Uh, the only thing that's left in Ani are the churches. Everything else is gone. This was a place where the capital was at. The king had a palace. Uh, there were 100,000 people living in Ani. 100,000 people in the 10th century was more than were living in Paris or London at the same time. So this was an internationally known city a place that I always wanted to visit in my uh, life. Uh, and this is the church of the Holy Apostle Surprigich. It's a completely circular planned church which has collapsed halfway and is in danger of collapsing further from earthquakes. You can see here that there are still some frescoes which still have remained. And it was built around the 11th century. You can see the construction technique, the very strong construction technique, but you can see the damage from earthquakes. Those large sort of uh, breaks are from earthquakes, and of course it has collapsed. Only half of the church is left. Uh, this is another church. I'm just not gonna show you too many of the churches because I know you can get overwhelmed and, and you won't remember all the names, but uh, this is a well-known church by an Armenian merchant called the Church of Tigran Honens. It's well known for its frescoes. So on the outside and on the inside are paintings. You can see that actually there's some kind of modern equipment here. And then you can say, what's happening here? Well, the Turkish government renovated the church, but they didn't do it completely. The, the dome has not been completed. There's just a piece of glass over this part of it. So it's kind of just that. Now, why is this church interesting also? Because it's right along the border with Armenia. So here's the river, which is the Arpa River. This is Armenia. This is Turkey. You're, you're not more than you know, 100 yards, 10 yards across the river. You're in Armenia. Uh, I've been on the other side, right on the border, also looking, but I couldn't obviously cross. You cannot cross. There's no place to cross from Ani into Ani, Turkey, into Armenia. And then we come to the Mother Cathedral of Ani, which is the most famous uh, standing uh, monument, which was built in the uh, 10th century, we believe around the year 1001, by the Armenian king Gagik and by the architect Terdat. It is believed to be one of the largest churches in all of Armenia. You can see here one corner of it is completely collapsed from earthquakes. So this is from the 1988 earthquake, which devastated northern Armenia. 
also affected this area of uh, Anin. It's just a, uh, an amazing church uh, filled with meaning, spiritual meaning. Look at the size of this church. We're looking at the area where the altar would have been, the Bema, and then uh, the large area. This is all whitewashed and then covered with frescoes. So it, originally it had, again, paintings at Anin. And then, uh, again, you can see here some sort of foundation. There was at one time a bridge which crossed the river back in the times when Ani was under Armenian control, back in the 11th century. And this is still the Arpa River, this is Armenia, and this is Turkey. So you come to Ani and you are really immersed in the memories of this place as a place which grounds you in Armenian history because this was a place which was so important in Armenian history uh, and remains important today for a variety of reasons. And then one more church, as it looked about uh, 10 years ago, called the Sur Prikor St. Gregory Church. You can see the damage. But then let's look at it today. And actually, the Turkish government has embarked on a renovation program. They have renovated this church. And you can see the renovation work is still underway. And this has all been repaired. So there is work by the Turkish government. Why? Because they realize this is a potential tourist site. I was amazed, I looked at the figures here. Last year, only 20,000 tourists visited this place. Only 20,000, it's not a very you know, visited place. But it is so important uh, in Armenian history. And then the walls again. Look at the massive size of the walls at Ani. We spent here uh, three hours, and I could have spent the whole day and another two or three days, but the time that we had was about three hours. Uh, that We walked around, there was no one else in the whole place. We were the first and only tourists. Just as we were leaving, a small group uh, also of Armenians happened to, to show up. And then we get to the, the, the contested memory of what happens in Armenian history. Contested because right outside of Ani is a monument which reads for the remembrance of the Turks slaughtered by the Armenians in this village. The date given on this plaque is April 24, 1918. Ah, the date is very important, right? April 24th. 1915, but here the, the plaque commemorates uh, that the villagers who were killed. Now, were villagers killed? They may have been. Why do I say that? Because this is 1918. This is way after the Armenian Genocide, and this is when uh, Armenian groups who were in the area were defending themselves often against uh, the new onslaught of the nationalist Turks in this area. However, this is right outside of Ani, so you get to see, again, contested history and contested memory. Uh, now we're moving towards Van, and I just wanted to briefly show this uh, slide. This is the ancient capital of Armenia called Yerbantashat. This is 3,000 years old, 4,000 years old. It's an ancient capital of Armenia. Look at this river. This is Armenia. This is an Armenian village, and this is a Turkish village. And so actually the, the border here is just, again, the river. And we actually had a little uh, picnic right on the Turkish side, but we were no more than 100 yards from the other side. What was interesting was I was told that the Turkish and Armenian villagers exchange goods. So there's no sort of formal boundary here. Uh, the villagers fish sometimes, and they exchange goods. So it's good to see this, that there is some kind of communication between the Armenians and the Turks. Uh, actually, we had here sort of, uh, sort of it was a, I guess you should call it some kind of meat, beef, I guess, that was grilled. And then pilaf, which is Armenian, uh, was just rice, a rice dish, which was uh, pretty much prevalent in the area. Mount Ararat from the Turkish side. Uh, so I've traveled now to an area which is called Igdir, Do Bayezid. For those of you that are my students, I'll fill you in with the names. Uh, so if you don't get all the names, uh, I can tell you what they are. But this is the peak of Mount Ararat from the Turkish side, 17,000 feet high. To me, it was an important uh, place to visit because I was on the road to Vaughan. And what I was thinking about was the reverse, the road from Vaughan to this place. Because my grandparents, in 1915, to escape the genocide, had traveled on foot from Vaughan to Igdir to Armenia to escape the genocide. So I was actually doing sort of a reverse tracing of the same path that my grandparents had taken almost 100 years ago. And the waterfalls at Pergri, which is very near, uh, very near Vaughan, this is a site called Pergri. It actually looks like to be a very beautiful area. It is. 
but it has a tragic history. All of the Armenians in this area were massacred. They were killed by the uh, Turkish government. This is documented in uh, Ramon Kevorkian's book called The Armenian Genocide. Uh, and actually, I was reading it, and the places that I visited are filled with the memories of that event, those events as well. But it's actually an area of beautiful waterfalls. Now, Vaughan, which is to me, uh, was this really the sort of the high point in my uh, trip. We stayed at the Hotel Semira. We arrived on, uh, at night, almost at night. It's still, this is on another day, but we arrived at night. And the first night I was going to sleep, it was about, I guess, 10 o'clock in the morning, at, at night. And all of a sudden, I was almost asleep, and then an earthquake hit. It was about a six on the earthquake Richter scale, which is very powerful. I was almost shaken out of my bed. And all of our you know, people got up. Just last year, in October of 2011, there was a massive earth earthquake in Vaughan. And many thousands of people, hundreds of people were killed, and much of the city was destroyed. Here we had another earthquake. First thing they asked was, do we, do we want to leave? And I said, no, we're going to stay. But I want to show you, this is right outside my window from last year. So this is the remnants of that earthquake. That building was completely destroyed. There were thousands of people still living in containers. Remember the story of Armenia and Gumri and the containers? Thousands of people that I passed living in the containers in Vaughan. Uh, this is the place where we had breakfast. Uh, I'll show you something there. Oh, this is the food we ate. And I show that because there's halva over here. But this is what I remember from the stories of my own family. My grandmother used to make this cheese, which is a cheese made with, uh, it has, uh, Vegetables, and not vegetables, but plant life. Banjaret, which is greens, basically, okay? And it's called uh, jajuk in Armenian. And uh, it was a cheese that she made that I remembered. And also, uh, they're still eating it, and they're known for it in Bonn today. All right, you, when you came in, you saw some pictures along the uh, a wall over here. These were courtesy of the Albrechts. Uh, some of you remember Richard and Anne Albrecht. Richard <laughs> passed away a few years ago, but he donated his collection of historic Armenian photos to us. When the lights go on again, you'll see what I'm talking about. This is Lake Vaughan in the background. And we're climbing uh, up this hill by car to visit probably one of the three or four most important places for pilgrimage in all of Armenia, called the Monastery of Barak, which was seen here in this photo before 1914. It's called Yedi Kilese in Turkish, the seven churches, because there were, you can see these domes, and there are many of these domes in the area. Now this is what it looked like before 1915. Courtesy of virtual Ani, as it looked in 1989, you can see something has gone on. Well, uh, the church was sacked by the Turkish army and burned. This was the home to a very important relic, the relic of the Holy Cross, which had been discovered in the seventh century. And there's an Armenian church holiday called Varak, the church of the, the, the feast of the discovery of the Holy Cross. It took place here. The relic of the cross was discovered here in the seventh century. And then it was, this monastery was built by an Armenian king of Van. All that's left of it today, there was an earthquake last year I mentioned to you. I'm actually standing right in front of the entrance. What's happened is that all of this has been filled in with debris. You can't just walk in anymore. You have to climb over a hill. And so I'm standing way above the entrance. And actually, we were told we really shouldn't go in because it's in danger of falling at any moment. This was also the place where Freeman Heidi, the famous Catholicos, the famous Armenian bishop of Vaughan, had his headquarters. It is filled with the historical memory of the Armenians. To me, it was a very special place. It's today a Kurdish village outside of the area. Uh, there's a church, there's a home next to the church, which is owned by the village leader, who actually now takes care of the church because he knows that visitors come, so he makes sure that it's taken care of to some extent, and so that visitors can sometimes also give him some money. I mean, it's, you know, it's not a bad thing because it's actually being taken care of. These are Kurdish children. Okay? And as soon as they see tourists, uh, of course, they want to come for whatever they can get, candy or other kinds of things. Uh, Urartian fortress, the tombs of the Urartian kings. Ninth century, it's not 9th century AD, but 9th century BC. So this is a, a site which is 3,000 years old. 
This was the site of Urartian kings. But for me, again, it's what's next to it. Uh, this is the area which is called in Armenian Aikestan, the gardens of the city of Van. This was the, the, most, uh, the place where most people wanted to live in Van if they could. It was called the Aikestan, the gardens, because there were so many trees. Uh, this is the place that my grandparents were from. And they have told the story that this is where they lived, somewhere in this area. You can see there's nothing left. There are a few ruins. Uh, Turks or Kurds have dug up in this area lots of holes because they were looking for gold, believing that it had been buried there. I'm standing on the fortress looking down into Aikestan. There was a famous siege at, at Van in 1915, and the Turkish army was bombarding from up here down into the city. Aikestan is right next to the beautiful lake, Van, a beautiful turquoise-colored lake, one of the most beautiful lakes. And you can see here that I'm again on top of the hill, looking down into this area. Uh, so I was thinking about, yeah, my grandparents, my family, and what they had gone through and where they had lived, and wouldn't it have been nice? You know, my great-grandparents and their families are buried next to the churches in this area. So they are there somewhere. That's my family. That puts me into a sort of historical space that I can, uh, you know, connect to. I know that I wasn't from Fresno. I'm born in Fresno, but my family came from this place. And then we visited uh, the beautiful island of Aftamar, the famous island. The island of Aftamar, which was the capital of Armenia in the 11th century, not 10th century, I should say. The church of Aftamar here. You have to get on a boat. It's about a 20-minute ride. Right when we got to it, there was a little storm that came up, some rain and wind, but then it went away. But here it is. And then here's the church. Uh, this is a church that has had a, a very interesting history in the past few years. Uh, just a few years ago, the Turkish government decided to renovate the church and to reopen it, but not as a church, but as a museum. But once a year, Armenians would be allowed to hold a church service. Uh, I know that there was recently a pilgrimage here, and there was a, a liturgy here, which was held in September. Inside of the church, it's a very small church, because it was a palace church. It was built by the king for the Catholicos at the time, who was living on the island. It's completely covered with beautiful reliefs, which are scenes from the Old Testament of the Bible. I took maybe 100 pictures here. I'm just showing you a little bit of it, because I know it would be too much to show you much more. Some of you are familiar with the, the Bible story of Daniel and the lion's den. Here's Daniel with the lions, the three young men, and then various other reliefs. And you can see the entire outside of the church is covered with reliefs. The controversy is today that the Turkish government, at the time it remodeled it, would not allow a cross to be placed on top of the church. It has now been put up there. The cross is up there. However, it's only being allowed to be used as a church once a year that is, as a liturgy. Other than that, it's purely a tourist sort of museum site. Then I climbed up the side of the, uh, the, the island. Actually, there's a part of the island you can climb up, and then you can see how far we are from the shore. Here's just a small tourist shop and sort of a place you can eat. The only access is, of course, by boat. And so uh, you have to take the boat, and it's, there's a dock over here, and there's a dock over here. Here's the church itself. Turkish flag over here on the left. Here's the view of the lake again, Lake Vaughan, beautiful turquoise lake. We went swimming. Uh, it's a, sort of not too cold at this time of year. It's, a, it's filled with salt, uh, not salt that you eat, but uh, salt like uh, mineral salts. So it's not something you can drink. You can't drink the water. And then I went to the cheese market in Vaughan and uh, found piles of the Armenian cheese. I call it the Armenian cheese, but the people in, in Vaughan, it's Turkish cheese, and it's what they're known for. It's their specialty, and here it is. And then the Armenian fish, the Taraf fish, which is found only in uh, Lake Van, and it's in the center of the city of Van. This is uh, the central square. You can see the fish over here. You can see all of the other buildings in this area. And then we went for dessert one night, and I said I'd like to talk to you about food. It says Ali Usta. Usta means barbed in Armenian, master. He's a master dessert maker. <clears throat> and this is Khadaif, the Turkish Khadaif and ice cream. So um, they had all kinds of beautiful desserts, um, which would be very familiar to us here in the United States. 
one other uh, monument over here is Maheni Tur, which is the David of Sassoon story that you know. We have a monument here in Fresno. Uh, David of Sassoon's son is called Maher, and this is believed to be the spot where Maher entered into the mountain, uh, according to the legend, and has never come out. He's waiting for the time when the world will be purified so that he can come out again. In Armenian, it's called Maher's door, Maheri Tur. All right, next day. Now we're moving from Bonn along the, the shores of Lake Bonn to Bitlis and to Mush. Very interesting. A lot of Bitlises here in Fresno, right? This is the, the citadel at Bitlis. So there's a castle right in the middle of the city. Kurdish city, completely Kurdish. We arrived at about 4 o'clock in the afternoon. The call to prayer was going on. Here's the citadel, and here's the, one of the main streets of the city. And you can see the old city over here. Bitlis, to me, was, uh, again, a place of memories and a place of uh, contemplation. Of course, we all know William Saroyan and the story. He was born in Fresno, but his family was from Bitlis. But many of you have relatives from this area. It's also a sad place. Uh, most of the Armenian population of Bitlis was massacred. You know, many Armenians escaped, or many Armenians were taken on death marches. In Bitlis, they were massacred. Only Armenians that had left before 1915 had basically survived. It's a very sad place. You can feel it, for me, uh, in the air itself. Again, uh, the region of Lake Vaughan, near Bitlis, and then Mush. And this is sort of toward the end of the trip here. Population 82,000. Mush is the historic region known as Taron. Taron was the historic region of the Mamigonian Nakharar family. So in Armenian history, the Nakharars were the princes. They had lands, and this was the land of the Mamigonians, one of the most famous families in Armenian history. <coughs> uh, this is the Euphrates River, which flows through uh, parts of Mush, and this is a, a bridge known as Suluki Bridge. Uh, in Armenian history, famous because one of the great Armenian uh, fighting Fedais, by the name of Kevork Chabush, was shot and killed in 1907 uh, near this bridge, and he died under the bridge that is in this area. So in Armenian sort of historical memory, as a place of importance for the Armenian Fedais. It's an old bridge. It's a 12th century bridge built by Armenians. And then finally, Mush. And uh, I end with Mush because, uh, for me, Mush was, uh, again, a place I had a hard time picturing Mush before I actually got there, but it's a place of pilgrimage. Uh, and I visited this place. This is Mush in the background, the plains of Mush. It's the most fertile area, one of the most fertile areas in all of Armenia. And I happened to capture a beautiful rainbow. This was sort of towards evening. Uh, the first day we were in Mush, 7 o'clock in the evening. Very quiet, the sun is descending, the, the light was very soft. And I came to visit the monastery or church of Surp Garabed, Mosho Surp Garabed, one of the most famous of all the Armenian monasteries in Armenia because it was built by St. Gregory the Illuminator. And in it were the relics from uh, early Armenian saints. This is what it looked like. So St. Garabed, Garabed is St. John the Baptist. You know, he's called the forerunner in Armenian Garabed. Fourth century near uh, Mush Taron. It's about a 30 minute drive outside. And now it's in a Kurdish village called Chengar. This is what it looked like before 1915. Today, there's absolutely nothing left of the monastery except one fragment of what was once a chapel of that monastery. The rest of it was completely razed to the ground. It was completely destroyed, taken apart stone by stone by the Turks. I say the Turks, the Turkish government, after the genocide or during the genocide of 1915. There's nothing left of the spot itself. I'm going to show you that in the, in the video. You'll actually see the spot. There's nothing to see because it's an open area of land. The Kurdish villagers, of course, know what happened. Uh, they're not responsible for what happened, but they know what happened, and they know what was once here. These are Kurdish children. We had brought candles with us to burn, you know, in memory of uh, this wonderful monastery. Where did the stones go? Well, they were used to build some of the houses of the Kurds who lived in the village. So these are stones from Sub Garabed of Mush. Every house has a stone, a hachkar, something which was used. Now that's not untypical, right? 
uh, civilizations that come after it's already destroyed. The Kurds didn't do it here, but they're using it for, uh, for their homes. This lady, uh, Kurdish lady here, you can see their, their way the Kurds dress here. A very simple village. Uh, you know, it's not, they don't have any real kind of uh, uh, economic life. It's just, you know, farming. You have a few cows, you have a few sheep. I talked to the headman, uh, the head of the village. I know a little bit of Turkish. I, uh, so I was kind of talking to him and I said, well, how many kids do you have? He goes, I have 10 children. He was very proud. He had 10 children. They still have lots of children because the children work, right? And then they, they help the families. One of the saddest but most important places that I visited was Surp Garabed of Mush, because it had both religious significance, historical significance, and a place again to tie all of this history for, for the Armenians. This is kind of where the area was of the monastery, but here is the valley of Mush. In a moment, we're going to go into the city of Mush. And here now we're going to the city of Mush. And it's a modern city. So today, Mush is a modern city, Kurdish. Completely Kurdish. No Turks, just a few maybe Turkish officials, maybe city officials, but mostly Kurdish. Beautiful downtown. Actually, it was very nice. You can see the buildings are quite beautiful. Um, and then I said, I have to visit one other place in Mush that I had heard about, which to me was a place I had to go to. And in Armenian, it's called Arakelots Van. Arakelots is the monastery of the apostles. And to get there, you have to climb. So I had to get up at 5 o'clock in the morning because uh, the rest of the group didn't want to go. Uh, only one, myself and one other person wanted to go. Uh, here's the valley. We were staying in the city of Mush. It was a 30-minute drive to some place where then we had to just climb up this mountain. So here I am climbing with one guide. And this is looking back. But look how beautiful the, the valley is. The name Mush. One, one version of that is it comes from the Armenian word mashush, which means that the valley was filled with fog. And so they call it mush. That's one explanation for the name of the, of the city, of, of the city and the region. OK, this is what the monastery looked like before 1915. Founded by St. Gregory. It should be founded by St. Gregory, the founder of Armenian Christianity, that is the establishment of it. It was called the Arakelots because there were relics of St. Peter, St. John, and St. Andrew. The right arm, the left arm, I'm talking not about the whole arm, but the relics, the bones, were brought here in the fourth century and had been kept in this monastery until 1915. This is what it looked like before 1915. And then, actually, you see on the left what's called the St. Thaddeus Church, which was a small chapel, and then here was the monastery. I'm going to tell a story here, very briefly, that the most famous of Armenian rebels, or not rebels, but actually Fedais, that is fighters, was General Antranik. In 1901, General Antranik and his soldiers and his group were here in Surp Arakelots and were surrounded by 4,000 Turks. And there's the famous story of their battle, and then in the middle of one night they escaped because it was snowing and they were able to escape. This is how Arakelos looked before 1915, and this is what it looks like today. So this is all that's left of the St. Thaddeus Church, and then this is all that's left of the monastery. It's in a beautiful area. Actually, these mountains, which are a little bit behind, would be Sasun. So we're no more than you know, an hour away, half an hour away walking from Sasun. But now let's take a close-up look. This is the, this is the monastery that's all that's left of it. It was destroyed by the Turks, by the Turkish government, in 1915, during the Armenian Genocide. No one knows where the relics are at. The priests that were here were all killed. Uh, this is all that's left. The man that's with me is a Kurd uh, by the name of Erdogan, but his grandparents are part Armenian from Sasun. So his family is from Sasun. And we know that some Armenian women and children were taken in the genocide and were taken into Kurdish families, and they had children or married, and then these are their descendants. The area here was all dug up because, again, uh, according to him, he told me that Kurds and Turks had dug up thinking there were treasures here. Look in the background here. There's actually a Kurdish village, uh, about five families that come in the summertime to graze their sheep. They were very friendly. They offered us lavash and tan. 
which is a yogurt and water. I said, I better not eat any of this because, you know, eating something that you don't know about. But I said, whatever, I'm going to eat it. We ate, and I was fine. So, very friendly Turkish fa uh, Kurdish family. Well, yeah, we're just visitors, right? And my guy was Kurdish, so they were friendly to us. But I want to tell you that this was, to me, one of the most important places that I had visited. And then we're back in the city of Mush. I'm just going to quickly, we're almost to the end. Uh, this is the church of Surp Marine. Surp Marine, Saint Marine, was the most important church in the city of Mush. Today, ruins. Overlooking the city of Mush, the Armenians lived in what's called Berintal, which was the upper upper part of Mush. I know there are lots of Mushetsis, and afterwards we can talk about it. Uh, but we were looking for the Armenian remnants. There are a few Armenian families left in Mush. These are the Sasun Mountains. This was the old Armenian neighborhood, but they're not living here. There are really no Armenians living in the old Armenian neighborhood. Uh, I was told by our guide that this used to be the house of an Armenian priest. Uh, of course, the priest is no longer there, but it's uh, owned by a Kurdish family. And then finally, uh, our last part of our trip was back from Mush, up through the mountains of Bingol, up to Erzurum, and then back to Kars, and then we spent the night in Kars, and then back to Yerevan. So this last one is going to be just a few slides of Erzurum, Garim. Population 383,000. It's today a very large city. It's the largest city in, in this area. Very modern city, sort of concrete. It's a Turkish city. It's not so much a Kurdish city, so it's mixed population. Almost nothing left of the Armenian presence, except a couple of things I'm going to show you. Uh, this is where we happen to have lunch. I just wanted to show you. It says cha kebab. And then it says over here, pide ve lamajun, yemek cheshitle. So uh, there, we had lamajun. Uh, there was uh, donia kebab and other foods which we're all familiar with. Okay. Now. The most famous Armenian institution in Erzurum was a school founded in the early 19th century known as the Sanasarian Academy, Sanasarian School. This is the Sanasarian School. Today it's the city hall of the Erzurum. It is completely preserved because Kemal Ataturk, the founder of the modern state of Turkey, used this building as the headquarters for his first meeting of the nationalist Turkish movement in 1918. And so it has become a, an important spot for Turkish memory and Turkish history, because for the Turkish nationalists, this was where their movement started. However, it was the Sanasarian Institute, which was the most important educational institution in this area of what was historic Armenia, built during the time of the Ottoman Empire. That's all that we have of it today. And then I went outside and I was looking around and my friend and I found this mural, which is on a main street just across the street from this uh, Sanasarian Institute. You can't really tell what's happening, but people on horseback and they've got uh, weapons. It's a mural dedicated to the memory of the Turks who were killed by the Armenians in World War I. So these are, these are Turks who are being killed by Armenians. Why? Because this is the memory of 1918 and General Antranik uh, that, that the Turks in this area of Erzurum have. They're portraying you know, the same scenes that we are familiar with in Armenian, our stories and our memories of what happened here. I thought it was interesting because it shows again the contrast between uh, what the Turkish government would say and what the Armenians would say. Finally, uh, the last couple of slides, I'm at the end here. Uh, this is a train car. It's here in the city of Kars. We're back in Kars. This is where the Treaty of Kars was signed in 1920, which gave to Turkey, which gave to Turkey the land which was old Armenia, meaning Mount Ararat. The city of Kars, the city of Erzurum, was given by the Russians. <coughs> Russia, the communists, gave to the Turks all of this territory because they said, someday we'll get it back anyway. We're just going to sign it off. Did any Armenians sign the treaty? No, it was signed by the Russians, the communists, and uh, the Turkish nationalist movement, actually. And they use this ra uh, railway car today as a place of, uh, sort of for that. And then finally, in, on the way from Erzurum back to Kars, another monument to the Turks, the famous Battle of Sarikamish, 
in which 80,000 Turkish troops were killed by the weather. Because Enver Pasha, the general who was the minister of war in 1914, decided that he was going to attack the Russians in a surprise move. And in November, he sent the troops with himself at the, lip, at the head. And 80% of the troops died of exposure from the weather because they weren't prepared for it. Later, he blamed the Armenians. And this is right before the genocide started. This is a monument in the middle of nowhere on the way from Erzurum to Kars in the area of Sari Kamish. And finally, just to show you, go back from Kars. We went through Ardahan. I didn't bring any pictures today from Ardahan. We went back through Jabba. And we kind of had our final uh, farewell sort of meal in Georgia with our group. And then we stopped in Gyumri for a moment because I wanted to uh, show you, this is Charles Aznavour Square, uh, which is back in Armenia, uh, which is in the center today of the city of Gyumri. And then finally, I said, we have to stop one more place. Our people said, where are you going to stop? take me? I said, we got to go to the, to the place where General Antranik's soldiers lived. It's a city called Ujan, uh, which is a village in the outskirts of Yerevan. And this was our final uh, stop. So this is a monument to General Antranik, the famous uh, fighter for the Armenians. And it's in the village of Ujan. OK, uh, so we're at the end right here.